Well, hi, everybody. I am, for those of you who don't know me, Robin Gross. I'm one of the APDs. And today my talk was supposed to be about asthma and COPD, which are just two diseases that deserve their own subject. So we're going to do obstructive disease one uh, today, which is going to be asthma. And um, I don't have any disclosures. And here are my objectives. Um, at the end of the presentation, the learner should be able to describe the pathophysiology of asthma, understand the approach to treatment, including new changes in guidelines, and list considerations for the management of acute asthma. And so we're going to do this in cases. There's a lot of information here. It's, it's really um, not to be memorized. It's sort of for you to kind of get a flavor in the context of clinical cases. Um, and I have extra data slides and, and pathophysiology mechanisms that you can take a look at since this is recorded afterwards. So a 20-year-old Caucasian female presents with a chronic cough for six weeks. Initially, she had an upper respiratory infection. And I wrote, it's not COVID because one of the people where my sister worked was hugging people and walking around and coughing and saying it's not COVID, but it is COVID. So in this case, it's not COVID. Um, dyspnea with exercise, but she can run through it and then has symptoms afterwards. And she does awaken cough, um, sometimes coughing at night. She never had prior respiratory problems and she does have a history of childhood and occasionally even now uh, mild season allergies. She's on oral contraceptives. She doesn't have any drug allergies. She doesn't smoke, but her roommate does. And she, um, as far as alcohol, she's a college student. So I leave that up to you to decide how much alcohol she's drinking. Um, and she has a mother with asthma. Um, and in the past, she's had a pruritic rash um, that comes and goes. And she also has reflux. So this is her physical. Um, stable vital signs, oxygen saturation is great. She's not in any respiratory distress. She has a little bit of rhinitis. Um, otherwise, normal lungs, normal physical exam. So the question is, does the patient have asthma? And so um, is there anybody in the audience who would like to hit your space bar maybe and say like what could support the fact that this might be the case for, that this might be asthma? Sort of like if we were sitting in the room and you had some ideas about like her history. All right, well, in the interest of time, I'm gonna say yes, she probably does have asthma. And so she has a family history, her mom has it. Um, she has the rash is eczema. She has triggers like rhinitis and probably allergic rhinitis. Um, and so these would increase the risk that she has asthma. So then you want to think about pathophysiologically, what is it? And the word that comes to mind sometimes is inflammation, which is true, bronchospasm, which is true, but it's really a disease of airway hyperreactivity. And so that subsequently leads to inflammation, recruitment of inflammatory cells, leaky airways, edema, mucus plugging, bronchoconstriction, in some case, cases even remodeling. And so what we need to know is that initially they're going to have airflow obstruction that's going to be reversible that subsequently is irreversible and at that point you can have remodeling. And so, you know, there are these things of phenotypes, sort of the way that we express disease, and then these endotypes where um, it, where it kind of hits the mechanism of the inflammation and they're interrelated. Um, and so what we talk about is um, T2 high and T2 low, with T2 high being the um, uh, allergic asthma. Um, and as you can see, it's not really as easy as that. Um, these are just, this is just a schematic of some of the um, uh, inflammatory pathways and where we have um, uh, immunotherapy to block those uh, pathways. And what we also have to rem remember is the leukotriene pathway and that with leukotrienes you can have um, even more so than histamine, you can have worsening inflammation, worsening, worsening smooth muscle contraction. And so really what happens is you have this like mediated antigen presenting cell is really a dendritic cell that presents the antigen to the T2 cells. Um, and then they will say, stop making IgG and IgM and make IgE, 
Um, and then subsequently, you're going to get sloughing of the alveolar epithelium, you're going to get hyperplasia and hypertrophy of submucosal and goblet cell glands and increased mucus production, um, bronchoconstriction, and then um, you're going to have um, sloughing of the, of the airway epithelial cells, which also respond to um, inflammation. And so you go from this like nice open airway to this closed airway, and you can see how if this is not opened with a bronchodilator and treating it with uh, anti-inflammatory, over time that's going to be an issue. And so we also know that there are certain things that induce um, hyperreactivity. And so there's the early response and then there's the late response. And the late response actually causes your hyper-responsiveness to, to be worse. So um, that may be something that lasts over time. So sometimes people will describe having symptoms or an exposure in the morning and then eight to 12 hours later they have symptoms again. And that's not quite as easily reversed. And if you were to take antigen and drop it through a bronchoscope into airways, you can see this hyperplasia, hypertrophy, and swelling um, of the airway. And then um, here you can see a lot of inflammatory cells, many of them eosinophils, and this is just mucus that's produced in the airway. You can see how it just plugs up that airway and then you have the bronchoconstriction bronch around it. And in some places you can get airway remodeling. So subepithelial fibrosis, basement membrane increase, um, angiodysplasia. Um, so, you know, all of these things, and there may be some people who are more predisposed to airway remodeling and whether or not it's up or downstream is not entirely clear, but we do know that ongoing inflammation can increase the, the risk for that. And so really what we're, what's been described in these cluster analyses has been like five phenotypes of asthma. There are some that have mild disease. There are some that have a lot of inflama inflammation, not so many symptoms. They're the ones who really scare us because they can't tell how bad their disease is. Um, we have not a lot of inflammation, but maybe in obese females, a lot of symptoms. We do know that adipokines can influence the airway inflammation um, and may not allow egress of some of the inflammatory mediated uh, inflammatory cells. So um, just to keep in mind that it's not really just one disease. And so you guys know what the symptoms are, a lot of dyspnea, cough, wheeze, or chest tightness, band feeling around the chest. Um, you may hear bronchospasm. You, they may be super tight and they don't have any, um, they just have decreased air movement, um, something like you would expect in a COPD patient, um, or they may have normal exam. And so the question is, what's the next step? So I'm just gonna ask these rhetorically so you can take a moment and think, normal exam, does she have asthma? So the next step would be pulmonary function tests. And so, this is an example of a good um, exhalation. So you want them to exhale for at least six seconds. Um, inspiration and exhalation. And if you can sit on it, it's obstruction. So in this case, you can see that there's, this is pretty severely obstructed. And sometimes that's all you see. The pulmonary function tests don't indicate that there is obstruction. But if you look at this, you might see that there is. And as I mentioned, it can initially be reversible and then be fixed. And this is just an example of, well, let's just lie and say that they're her pulmonary function tests. And so um, just to review, when you look at your, the first thing you look at is the ratio of the FEV1 to FVC. And if it's less than 10% predicted, then it's obstruction. So you would look at this and say 883 minus 8.3. And then this is less than that. Another way to look at it, particularly in the gold guidelines for COPD, is if the FEV1 to FVC is less than 70%, then maybe obstruction. Then we look at the FEV1 to determine what the severity of the obstruction is. Um, and so um, this would be mild, because anything from 70% to 100% is mild. And then you look to see if there's um, any um, reversible component like bronchodilator response. So this was 2.42, which is 2,420 cc's, goes up to 2,740 cc's. So you need an absolute change of 200 cc's and a 12% difference. It can't be mix and match. So in this case, the FEV1 
definitely falls into that category, okay? Normal volumes, DLCO, and normal saturation. So what should you do next? Tell her she's recovering from her colds. Prescribe an as-needed short-acting bronchodilator. Just treat her post-nasal drip. Ask more questions or prescribe inhaled corticosteroids. So whenever you get a question like this, this is always the correct answer, ask more questions. So we know that according to guidelines, we should measure asthma severity, which is then going to influence what we choose, how we choose to treat the patient. We do that according to, um, everybody has power, yay. Okay, so um, that is based upon daytime symptoms, nighttime symptoms, and pulmonary function, okay? Um, the other thing that's really interesting is that um, if you have more than one exacerbation in a year, even with normal everything, kids are like this. They'll be totally fine and then they'll get an exacerbation and then they get admitted to the hospital. Um, so if you've had more than one exacerbation, then you're no longer determined to be intermittent. And so you would be then mild. And so based upon that, these steps, we then decide how to treat the patient. And so we need to ask the severity question. So her pulmonary function puts her in the mild to moderate category. And her symptom pre frequency, it turns out when you ask her specifically, how many times does this happen at night? And she says three times a week. And on the track team, she may have exercise-induced asthma, but she has symptoms when she just gets out on the field because she probably has allergic, allergic rhinitis and allergic asthma to grasses. So this all puts her in the moderate persistent category. And so you want to start with trigger control. Everybody has different triggers. I've told you this before. It is said that patients would rather get rid of their doctors than their pets, and it's absolutely true. Um, and so we then need to work within this context. Um, and so, again, remembering that some exposures are going to increase the hyperreactivity of the airway. And so um, these are the inducers. So you have a certain hyperreactivity and then you are exposed to whatever this trigger is. And then the next time, then you're, you know, like say a virus, for example, and then your hyperreactivity is up to here. So whereas before you might have only wheezed with colds or never had any symptoms, now you have more persistent symptoms. And so that's why allergen control is really important. Um, upper respiratory infections, specifically viruses and um, atypical bacteria, and then occupational exposures, um, sulfur dioxide, toluene diisocyanate, um, and ozone. Keep in mind, too, that workers in a lab um, can then develop uh, a, an allergy to the rat antigen in the urine, and so they might have to find after building a career, they may have to find another job. And so, um, you know, they're not necessarily in disability, but it can really interfere with their career and we're supposed to advise them to get other jobs. Um, specific irritants, um, there's no increase in hyperreactivity. Um, exercise, because we start by breathing through the nose, which warms and humidifies uh, the airways. And then when we start breathing through our mouths, we lose that humidification of the turbinates. And then pharmacologic agents, aspirin, beta agonists, uh, beta blockers, sorry. Um, and so the, the, the key is to remember if, if the problem is really the trigger, if somebody's coughing all the time, it just has horrible post-nasal drip, you know, maybe it is the upper airway cough syndrome, or maybe we just have to control the upper airway and treat with as uh, you know, for asthma now, but once the trigger is controlled, it's not going to be an issue anymore. And then uh, reflux is, is something else to control. Um, there was a class of paper, I think, in the New England Journal quite a while ago about um, treating undiagnosed or un asymptomatic reflux. That does not help. But treating symptomatic reflux does help. And so in addition to trigger control and vaccination, where, oops, sorry, um, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about um, what your options are for treatment, but this is um, not, this uh, length of this talk doesn't lend uh, time to talk about these in detail, um, nor would we want to looking at this slide. Um, but you can see how that 
uh, corticosteroids really have an effect on so many aspects of cell inflammation, not leukotrienes, however, which um, uh, it, we had mentioned before. Um, and then just knowing um, how bronchodilators work, um, and then knowing also that long-acting, that llamas, long-acting anti-muscarinic agents can be helpful, um, either with inhaled steroids or in addition to inhaled steroid alaba uh, as well. Um, and then I'm just going to throw the biologics out there just to show you that we do have other um, drugs that are maybe helpful, for example, in other diseases as well. So in um, ABPA or in sinusitis or in with really severe eczema. Um, and then they all have their different qualifications about what um, criteria they need to meet in order to get these biologics. Um, and then just to remember bronchial thermoplasty, if there is um, increased airway remodeling, bronchial, bronchial thermoplasty will kind of zap the smooth muscle. And safety studies on that have been very helpful. They do initially get um, exacerbations that might require hospitalization. Um, we don't know about long, long term in terms of if bron bronchiectasis will be an issue, but stay tuned. Um, and so this is really neat because these are the new guidelines that just came out. And if I have one message to all of you, um, the message today is going to be the paradigm for mild or an intermittent asthma has changed and we need to change with it. And so here they say use as needed ICS and formoterol. So formoterol, so this is um, what we have in this country as Simbacorp, okay? Um, and so for step two, as you go up, it's just a LABA, um, ICS and a LABA. But the important thing to remember is that, and it's taken them a long time to do this, and, and it's not even the NHLBI, it's the GINA, the international guidelines of which Americans are represented. Um, but what we know is that a lot of patients are not compliant with their medications, um, and that when they take they may just take their medications when they need it. And so whenever they use a, a short-acting beta agonist, they should be using an inhaled steroid with it. Um, one reason for the formoterol being helpful is that um, it has a short-acting and a long-acting bronch long bronchodilator property so that it can be used for uh, chronic maintenance in addition to as needed. And so even if you have patients who just use that PRN albuterol, um, you want to give them an inhaled corticosteroid with it and ask them to carry two inhalers with them if you cannot get it in the combined form. And so our patient would probably be in one of these categories. And so she would be getting um, a low dose um, inhaled corticosteroid and a LABA. And so other things you have to think about are comorbidities. So obstructive sleep apnea, anxiety, depression. If you have a lot of sputum production, don't think asthma, it's gonna be bronchiectasis and certainly ABPA, or we've diagnosed patients with cystic fibrosis in their 30s and 40s. So that's always something to think about, as is vocal cord dysfunction. Um, we talked a little about the upper airway cough syndrome. Patients can have asthma, COPD overlap, um, or is it something else, CHF in addition? whatnot, obesity. So then you want to think about, well, we see a lot of patients in the outpatient setting, and we have these laptops for peak flow and spirometry. What happens in a case like this? We have a 42-year-old Latinx male with the following PFTs. And so here you see, when you look at the FEV1 and FEC, you see these numbers look restrictive, right? But if you go down and you look over here, your RV is elevated. And so this is an example of where you have air trapping. And so this is the pseudo restriction of air trapping where your residual volume goes up. So your force vital capacity goes down and that's your denominator. So it's not gonna look like it's obstructed. So if all you got were spir was spirometry, you may then say, oh, he probably just has restrictive disease because he's obese. 
But this may be a case where you have to send somebody along for the full pulmonary function test to look at their volumes as well. And this is just an example of airway hyper, of a hyperinflation. Um, the abnormal, this is an expiratory film, and what looks like ground glass opacity is really the normal lung. And this area right over here is air chopping. That's the abnormal lung. So kind of interesting. So when in doubt, what do you do? You can empirically treat the asthma. Maybe you want to get serum eosinophils and IgE. Um, you might want to do rest set testing, um, you know, for the blood you know, initial screening of um, uh, allergy testing in the blood, where zone two, by the way. Um, uh, you may want to do a methacholine challenge or an exercise challenge where the patient exercises and then you do spirometry in the 10 or 15 minutes afterwards. And her history about being able to, to run through her symptoms only to have them when she stops after exercise is very simple. It could be a, a good, um, she may be a good candidate for an exercise challenge. Or maybe it's something else. Maybe it's pulmonary hypertension and you want to do a cardiopulmonary exercise test. Or in the 50-year-old obese African-American male with um, hypertension and diabetes and hyperlipidemia, you may want to go down the cardiac route. So you have to individualize this for each of your patients. And then this is just an example of the methacholine challenge. So nonspecific bronchial hyperreactivity. You give doubling doses of methacholine and then you look for the biggest change in FEV1. So you want to you want to see a drop of 20% in your FEV1. If it happens at a low dose, they're more hyper hyperreactive. If you get to 16, eight, most of us say eight or 16, and you still haven't dropped your FEV1 by 20%, then they probably don't have asthma. But there are certain things that can affect that. So upper airway inflammation can give you a positive methacholine challenge. Taking inhaled corticosteroids can give you a, a negative methacholine challenge. So just you want to think about that. Um, so um, I think I'll go through to the next um, uh, the next case, and then certainly happy to answer any questions afterwards. So your long-standing obese 45-year-old African American female patient with moderate to severe asthma presents for follow-up visit. She's had some asthma symptoms with the change in season, but she feels a lot better today. Her ACT asthma control test score is 14. Her peak flows have been best 200, would be, excuse me, have been 200 with a best of 420, so less than half normal. This is a peak, these are peak flow meters. They're all a little different. It's your poor man's pulmonary function test that moderate to severe asthmatics can have at home and keep a symptom diary um, in addition to an action plan where they, which is individualized for the patients, which gives the patients the kind of the sense that they have a little bit of autonomy, they're like their own um, healthcare provider, and also, you know, I really stress that in education that um, this is really a team effort. And so, um, it's helpful when they have that, and so you can kind of calculate how high or low the peak flow is. You know, your patient, look, when they start to get the peak flow that falls, they really precipitously drop. So you may then just get in there and say, quadruple your dose of inhaled corticosteroid, or take this prednisone since it takes four to six hours to kick in, and then, then we can decide. Um, okay, and this is the asthma control test, which still remains humbling to me. Um, where we think they're doing okay, but they answer this simple little test, and if the score is less than 19, like less than 20, and you can see 25 is the highest you can get, then they're poorly controlled. And it is eye-opening. You're like ready to finish the visit, and then you look at this and you're like, wait a minute, we have to go back and control this asthma. And so this is the asthma control according to the guidelines. Um, and that is based on symptom frequency, pulmonary function, and also control tests. We use the asthma control test here. And so that will categorize you into control. Um, and the important thing to remember is whenever we're making changes in medication, um, particularly when patients first come in with severity, um, we wanna wait three months until stepping down. Now, if somebody just has a virus and they, have, they need to go up on their medication for a transient period of time, you don't necessarily need to keep them there three months. 
Um, but it might be in their interest to do that and you just have to decide. So this patient is using fluticasone and salmeterol, montelukast, albuterol, nasal flonase, a fluticasone, and um, sinus lavage. But is she? Because she's had two ER visits and one hospitalization for asthma in the past year. And so um, these are things that you find on further examination. She lost her inhaler. She felt better, so she never refilled her nasal fluticasone. She stopped smoking on Saturday and resumed her, when she resumed her medication, and she just used albuterol for the third time today, which is why, like in this patient, this would be the perfect patient to say, whenever you use your albuterol, take your inhaled steroid, because at least they're treating some of the inflammation. So it's really important for you guys to think about what are barriers to care. Our auditors tell us that we should use the word non-compliant non in our um, billing codes because it pays more. But it's really not a word that we want to use to describe our patients. And so is it really compliance? Like maybe the patient couldn't get to the doctor and get another prescription refill. Uh, maybe there is an access to good health care. Um, you know, maybe the physicians in these certain wards um, aren't aware of the latest treatment um, recommendations. Maybe there are comorbidities, um, may not even be able to afford it. And then do they really understand when we're talking and we don't, we say like an attack or an exacerbation, what does that really mean? So you really want to think about, you know, what what terms you want to use. And then maybe they're using it, but they're just not using a good te technique. They don't know when to dispense it. They don't know about the breath hold. They breathe out through their nose. Um, and so just one thing to remember that's always humbling for me is the privilege gap, gap in medicine that most medical students are in the upper quartiles and many of our patients are in the lower socioeconomic quartiles. And um, you think that they would be very forthcoming with you, but a lot of times they're very embarrassed. Um, just, you know, especially I remember the 2008 um, uh, circumstance where I finally asked my patient, like, you know, are, are you just, is it that you're forgetting or that you can't afford it? And he said that he almost lost his house. So I think it's really important to remember to discuss that. Um, and as you can see, depending on race and ethnicity, um, different populations are affected by um, asthma. And, and although the deaths have been decreasing, they are disproportionately high in certain populations. So in this, for example, um, in, uh, with regard to mortality, African Americans have the highest mortality. They also have higher hospitalizations. And so although it is a, it's ubiquitous worldwide, um, it's still an issue uh, depending on populations. And even with Latinx, um, Puerto Ricans will, for example, have a, like 25% incidence of um, asthma or prevalence of asthma in the population versus Mexicans, for example. But I think it's really important to remember that this woman is at increased risk for death. And I really, when I have patients who have been hospitalized, intubated many times, I think it's really important not to sugarcoat it, but to say, you know, I'm really worried about you because all of these things, they have difficulty in perceiving how bad their airflow obstruction is. And, and this is when we hear about asthma deaths in this day and age. Um, in this case, and two, she in the office has a little bit of accessory muscle use, tachypnic, hypertensive, tachycardic. 91% on room air, and has decreased breath sounds throughout despite using her albuterol, um, and has no wheezing simply because she's not moving air. So what would you do? Prescribe oral corticosteroids, say continue the current me uh, medication, but you just need to be compliant. Send her to the ED, administer a SABA, then assess for response, or check PFT. So hopefully in your brains, you're saying send the patient to the emergency department. Because these are the concerning issues. She has poor control, her ACT is 14. Her peak flow is less than half. She took the short acting bronchodilator and she's probably not responding to it now. 
she can't tell how bad she is and she is using accessory muscles. So all of these are reasons to send her to the emergency department. So they give her nebulizers, they give her oxygen, they give, this is a um, nebulizer kit for a kid, which is just simply adorable. Um, IV methylprednisolone, which takes hours to kick in. So she's still dachypnic, but she looks more comfortable. She feels better. Her peak flow is 140, and this is her blood gas. pH 7.34, PACO 2.43, PAO 2.63. So what's the next step? Admit her to the floor, observe her in the emergency room, admit the patient to the ICU, or discharge her with instructions to return to pulmonary clinic first thing in the morning. And hopefully you could see my ICU antenna raising, rising right now, uh, because that would be the thing to do, it'd be to send her to the ICU. And why is that? Well, as I mentioned, the timing of systemic steroids, which is why when patients are having exacerbations and they get to the, a certain point, I just say, take the prednisone even before you call me. Um, but in this case, um, Couple of other things. You need to like follow her for objective measures, maybe peak flows. But the thing that's really concerning about this is that she has a, a, an acidosis, and any one of us would be blowing our PCO2 down to the 20s or 30s, which is probably what she was doing at the beginning. And she just, this is respiratory muscle fatigue. And so she's just not able to blow out that CO2 anymore. And this is somebody who is at risk for needing to be intubated. Maybe she needs a little bit of non-invasive ventilation, um, but she's relatively hypoxemic for her. And then, as I mentioned, the CO2. And then this is an example of an algorithm that the emergency department might use. Um, they're all a little different. But in the ICU, the patient develops further respiratory distress and she's intubated. Following intubation, the respiratory therapist notes that it's very difficult to bag the patient. So difficulty bagging can be secondary to a number of things. Bronchospasm, increased airway resistance, causing increased airway resistance. Um, patient biting the ventilator, maybe some mucus plugging with coughing, um, all of these things. Um, this is an inspissated mucus and airway sloughing of a patient who died, and it's basically asphyxiation. So um, on a ventilator, you might see something like this, where you have a very high peak pressure. So this is re reflective of your resistive pressure, but your plateau is relatively normal. And so that may be a case where maybe the patient's even biting on the tube, for example, um, or maybe you need to give a bronchodilator. Um, so one thing to keep in mind is also when we intubate them, because of all of this inflammation and mucus plugging, you really, you know, they're really at risk for atelectasis as well. So we try to use a slightly larger endotracheal tube. If for some reason your patient, uh, um, uh, were to become hypoxemic and have very high peak and plateau pressures together that are new, um, you know, one thing you might think about would be attention pneumothorax, for example. And then what do you think about this? Let's just take a minute to take a look at that. And by the way, the map is 50. It was fine before. So here's your flow, and here's your pressure. So that patient was on volume control ventilation before. So this was volume control where you had a peak and a plateau, okay? And now you're on pressure control ventilation, so you can't get your peak or your plateau higher than that. The one thing we cannot control is going to be vo uh, the volume, the tidal volume. So that changes a little bit. But what hopefully you all see here is that um, air trapping or auto peep, where the flow isn't coming right to zero before you get another breath, the other breath is happening. And so they need more of an expiratory time, a longer expiratory time. So you can either change the flow to increase the, the expiratory time, or you can just decrease your rate altogether which will decrease both your inspiratory and your expiratory time and give them a little bit more time to um, exhale 
And so what happens is air accumulates in the chest and um, will decrease your venous return from the increased pressures in the chest, and therefore it's going to be um, a lower uh, a lower MAP. Uh, this happens uh, also after intubation when everybody's really excited that the patient got into that the fellow got it on the first try, and they're like bag 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 bag, and so. I have to remember to ask the respiratory therapist up front not to bag quickly. Um, and so we, this is something that we want to keep in mind. If somebody is retaining CO2 but having problems with auto peep, then we do what's called permissive hypercapnia, where as long as your pH is like 7, 2 or above, it doesn't matter if they retain CO2 um, and they're acidemic. We just want to make sure that they're, you know, we can oxygenate them and they're hemodynamically um, stable. Um, what else do I have to say about that? Oh, one other thing when you intubate patients, especially with COPD, if um, you put them on a ventilator and they're chronic retainers, and you give them too high admitted ventilation, which is the, the rate times the tidal volume, and the rate is too high, then what's going to happen is they're going to spill their bicarb, and that's their metabolic buffer for their rest, chronic respiratory acidosis. And so when you go to take the patients off the ventilator, they're, not, they're going to go back. Their brains are going to be set to retain CO2, but they're not going to have that buffer, which is why it behooves you, another reason, to keep them a little bit more on the acidemic side so that they don't spill their bicarb. So when the time comes to liberate them from the ventilator, it's not as hard. So you sign your patient out for the night, and she seems to be doing well, but the next day her lactic acid level is 14. She is a febrile and hemodynamically stable, but the intern is in acute distress, tachypneic and tachycardic. So what happened? Why would all of a sudden she have a lactic acidosis, but she looks so darn good? All right. So... You want to think about lactic acid um, and what causes that. And in a case like this, um, I've actually seen this happen, um, and everybody was really worried about it. But the answer was just to stop the beta agonist. So first of all, they might have a little bit of lactic acidosis because of decreased oxygen delivery from the asthma exacerbation. Propofol is something that causes a type B lactic acidosis as well. It's the metabolite of the propofol. Um, I should mention that um, lorazepam or adipan, uh, um, uh, ativan is the diluent, is a propylene glycol type um, substance, and that in a buildup can cause an increase in, like, in lactic acid, which is why we don't use Ativan for drips. We only use Versa drips or um, midazolam. Um, but in this case, it's a lot easier for the respiratory therapist to just keep a continuous NEB going on a tight patient. But every once in a while, they'll forget to turn it off. And so that will cause a type B lactic acidosis as well. And the thought is that um, uh, pyruvate, uh, goes into like lactic acid instead of a Krebs cycle. Um, not entirely clear, but all these things conspire together. So in a case like that, you would switch them over if they needed it to um, a um, ipotropium or an anti-muscarinic. And they, at that point, they probably shouldn't need a continuous, um, continuous nebulizer anymore. Propofol can also cause a little bit of bronchodilatation for reasons I don't know, um, but that may help you a little bit. So your patient is recovering. We were able to liberate her from the ventilator. Um, we make sure that she gets vaccinated, right? Um, all patients with lung disease need the Pneumovax um, as well as the flu. Um, and then for, we'll give her some oral corticosteroids. There is no rhyme or reason to using a taper versus um, just a, a four or five day course. It may be longer for somebody who you know has kind of this long inflammatory state. Um, and so you may at that point want to increase the control of medication. Um, we don't necessarily always give them a peak flow meter or a diary, but it's just good form to at least um, there's clinical equipoise between both. Um, and so 
uh, you know, having them know a little bit more about their disease. Follow up in pulmonary clinic or with the primary care. Um, and then education is really important. Um, some people will say that, a sig you know, yeah, I smoke, but it doesn't, um, it doesn't affect my asthma. So it always affects their, their lung disease. And in some cases, you know, you might want to talk about um, uh, the new recommendation is to use uh, medications, um, but you can use them in terms of it with uh, nicotine replacement substances as well. But it's really important to talk about triggers and write this up. And a lot of times um, they may have a dust allergy, so I'll go to the American Lung Association. They have a good uh, educational series on dust allergens and how to minimize dust, for example. Um, but just to say, remember that um, communication is really going to be important. And sometimes I'll just say to them, if you're thinking about changing your medication or discontinuing your medication, can we just agree that you'll pick up the phone and call me? Um, and it's really important to display empathy and listen um, and make sure that this is shared decision making. Like, yeah, you're young. It's going to be really hard that you have to take this medication. I, I, I can't imagine. Um, but, you know, let's work on this together as a team. And this will give you actually a little bit more control and you won't have that fear of having an asthma exacerbation. So it's always helpful to schedule the appointment before they leave, let the, the PCP know about it. And then um, ideally, if we have people who can call them and just see how things were going. So many people get discharged and they don't have the particular medication in the, in the pharmacy they go to. And so they say, we'll get it in, in a day or two. And then the patient says, okay. So it's really important to say, you absolutely need to take medication from the moment that you leave. And if there are any issues with this, just give my office a call and um, we'll call and we'll call in a substitute that they might have at the present time. So the take home points are really that education is really essential and just to remember your health literacy level. Um, Avoiding and, if necessary, treating triggers, um, nasal steroid, nasal lavage, H2 or PPIs for, G for GERD. Um, a stepwise approach to therapy, which is really slow, particularly we start strong and then we step down. Understanding the barriers to treatment and then just the, the team approach for disease control.